Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> Today, we're going to cover just really very briefly. And, and I, I really thought and actually wanted to spend more time with this than I felt released to do. And so we're not rushing through this last aspect of the emphasis that we have been having on the ascension of Jesus. What is the significance of Jesus' ascension? <clears throat> why is it so central? And why is it so necessary for believers to make sure that when we're talking about the great work of God, that the ascension is at the top of the hill? The top of the hill, if you would. If we're climbing a theological mountain of God's work, we're at the top of the hill. And so today we come to the place of, you remember in Romans 8.30, for whom he has predestined those he has also called. And those whom he has called, he's also justified. And those whom he has justified, he's also glorified. <clears throat> so today we come to the the top, the absolute goal of God in creation. The goal of God, the purpose of God. Beginning in Genesis 1-1, the reason we read Genesis 1-1 and the reason we read the rest of the Bible is that God's eternal purpose has been a singular, narrow purpose purpose. And that is this, that he would have a people in whom he would set his own glory as these people would be included in the glory of his son. So this is the top, if you would, the very goal of God. This is what the Bible has been about since his writing, that God himself would be glorified in his people by him glorifying his people in his son, right? God himself would be glorified in his people by God glorifying himself and his people in his son. That's everything that God has been doing. That's the reason for the creation that's the, <clears throat> that was the purpose of God for Adam and Eve, which obviously he knew would not work because Adam was not a deified man. And so Adam fails in the garden. You remember that. And from that point on, from Genesis 3, 6, and he ate. At that point, when Adam ate of the fruit of the tree, sin came into the world and corrupted everything. But it did not prevent God's work. God was already moving forward. He was already prepared for this. He already knew it. The moment we read the words in Genesis 1, 3, let there be light. God already knew that Adam would refuse to obey. He already knew what he would do for the rest of the time frame, if you would, to bring humanity to this place. So this is not an afterthought. This is not something that God had to conjure later in order to kind of keep keep face with what he was doing. But the moment God said, let there be light, the moment the Lord said that, he committed himself to our glorification. I know that some people, I think incorrectly, say this. Well, if Jesus had not died, then you would not be going to hell. I mean, sorry, you would not be going to heaven. If Jesus had not died, there would have been no creation. Do you see this? We must think this way. God's will and work is a comprehensive unit. And so the issue isn't if Jesus had this or that had happened, whatever. Those things are impossible. God chose within the context of his own will for his own purpose, his own glory to create, knowing that when he created, all of this would happen. And yet he committed himself to it, not being committed to it, externally, but being committed to it internally by his own will and the integrity of his own purpose. 
Do we see that? And so what has happened is that God's will through all of this has been constantly moving forward, moving forward all the way to this great place. So let's get to the notes and let me see if we can get through this. <clears throat> After the fall, in order to fill his, fulfill his purpose, God sent his son to be the human vessel of his glory. Now remember, the whole issue of creation is this, that the glory of God the Father would be manifested in the vessels of his creation. That's the purpose of God. It's always been that way. Then after generations, you remember, all the time from Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 3, 6, all the way to the beginning in Matthew, thousands of years. After all that time, generations, God has brought forth a child in whom the fullness of his glory would finally reside. Remember Colossians 2, 9, the fullness of the, the deity is residing in this man. Finally, there comes to, into humanity a man in whom the fullness of the Father is going to be manifested. Who is this child? In Luke 1.32, he's called the Son of the Most High. You remember that. And we always have to connect our glorification with the glorification of Jesus. In Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact image of his nature. So this means that the glory of God came into the world as a man. You remember in John 1.14, what does John 1.14 say? And the Word, who is the Word? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John 1.14, and the Word became flesh, and what? De dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. That glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of what? Grace and truth. And so finally there is a man on the earth in whom the glory of God the Father is fully being manifested in this man named Jesus of Nazareth. So the glory of the Father is manifested in the very life and the very person and death of Jesus so that the same glory of God would be gifted to God's people when Jesus is glorified. And that's what we need to begin to see. The essence of our glorification is that we will be glorified. This is a done deal. It's just waiting its full fulfillment in the return of Christ. That we will be glorified with the same glory that the humanity of the Son of God enjoys before the presence of God the Father. We need to see that. We're not talking about something different. We're talking about God endowing us, endowing us with the same glory that Jesus, this heavenly man, has. Why? Because we are in him. And what God has done in him, he will do in us. Because we are in him. We are connected to him. We are one with him. We have been united to him. So we'll talk about this a little bit. The glory of the Father was manifested, as we said. So listen to the Father's testimony. You remember the Father's testimony about Jesus in John chapter 12. Jesus is saying, my soul is troubled. You remember, we're coming to the place of the uh, upper room, I mean, the uh, Last Supper. We're coming to the place of the trial. We're coming to the place of the crucifixion. And the weight of this is beginning to bear down on the Son of God as to his humanity. The weight of what is happening is bearing down on him. And he's beginning to be, if you would, beginning to be crushed by this even before we get to the upper room. He's beginning to experience the horror and the terror of what is coming in just a few hours. And he says, my soul is troubled. He said, but what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. You see, my will as a man wants to be saved from this hour. But I was born for this hour. This is the reason I have come into the world. And then Father, glorify your name. In other words, manifest the glory of who you are, the glory of your magnificence in my obedience. 
And then a voice came from heaven. He says, what? I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. And so we must see that the glory of God the Father is residential in this man, Jesus Christ, from the very conception in the womb of Mary until his death. And then, finally, of course, it is then reproclaimed, if you would, in the resurrection. Because we don't see the glory of God in the death of Christ until we see the resurrection. So God's purpose has always been to glorify his people in the glory of his son at his appearing. It's always been that way. This is what Jesus was talking about in John 13, 31. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. What we're doing this morning is making sure that we are connecting the glorification of God's people with the glorification of God's Son. It's not a separate glorification. It is the same glorification, but distinct in time. He is first glorified, and then we will be glorified when he comes. We will be glorified in him with his own glory. So how was the Son of Man glorified? You remember? Philippians 2.8. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. This man is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. This means that the glory of the fellowship, what is the glory of God we're talking about? It's a massive, massive issue. But specifically, I believe what the Lord wants to bear down on us is this, that the glory of God that is being manifested in Jesus is the glory of the fellowship of love between the Father and the Son that is on full public display in the humanity of the Son of God by the Holy Spirit. I believe this is the quintessential purpose of God to demonstrate to all creation the glory of this intra-Trinitarian love that exists and has always existed and will ever exist among the three persons of the Trinity. And that glory becomes visible in the humanity of the Son of God. As the Son of God is on the earth to do the will of the Father because he loves the Father. And the Father loves the Son because the Son is doing his will. And all of this is done, the Son's will is done. The Son obeys by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you see the love of the Spirit for the Son and for the Father to empower the Son to be the loving, obedient Son, even unto death. So you see the Trinitarian love there, that fellowship of three divine persons within the Godhead. Jesus was glorified. I'm sorry. So this is what Jesus said, John 5, 30. The Son loves the Father. And then he says in 1431, for I love the Father, and the Father loves the Son, rather. So that's what we're seeing here. The essence of the glory of God is this fellowship of love that exists within the Godhead. And Jesus was able to display the love of God. Why? Because he comes from the bosom of the Father. It's interesting in John 1.18. If you have your Bible, it's interesting. The word bosom here is translated in most of the translations, except for King James and New American Standard, as the side, the side of the Father. Your translation may say he came from the side of the Father. But when you look at the same word in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and you look at Abraham, it's talking about Abraham's bosom. It's the same word as bosom. What is the bosom? It's the very closest place of intimacy. Isn't that what it is? A child is in the bosom of his mother. What does that mean? That's the closest physical place that is indicative of the love between the child and the mother or the child and the father. This is the most intimate location. And so in John 1, 18, it says that Jesus came not from the side, but from the very bosom of the Father to declare in humanity, this is what it means to be in the bosom of the Father. I am showing you what the bosom of the Father, this relationship, this intimacy is all about. 
since, therefore, there is a glorified man in the presence of God, because he's been glorified there, because of his glorification, we will be given all things that the Father has given Jesus. Now, let's th let this stuff sink, sink into you. Because one of the things I know that we all are in constant need, we are in constant need of being encouraged and being fortified against the lies of the enemy, the activities of the world, and even the deceit of our own flesh. Isn't that right? And so things are going on in all of our lives. All of us have issues. Anybody in here not have an issue? Because if you do, we're going to get the paramedics here for you. You're dead. <clears throat> you're dead. That's, that's the definition of you're dead. You have no issues. All of us have issues. And the rock bottom truth that sets our feet on solid ground is that in spite of what we're going through today, the truth is that we, in God's intention and in his purpose, we are guaranteed by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. We are guaranteed by the Holy Spirit because there is a man who ever lives before the throne of God. We are in him. We are guaranteed by God because of the man who lives in heaven and his spirit who lives in us, we are guaranteed to be glorified on the day of Jesus' return. Do you see that? And so we need to remember this no matter what is happening in your life. No matter how many times you have failed to give, you failed to resist temptation. No, how many, no matter how many times you've made mistakes and you've done something wrong. No matter how much. We don't ignore that. But we stand in the midst of all of that failure and still proclaim we are God's people who are glorified in the intention of God, guaranteed in the living man in the heavens and by his spirit in us, we will be with him sharing in his glory on that day. We must have this mindset. Why? Because it's the truth. It's the truth. Too often our mindset is about things on the earth. Too often our mindset is about how we feel. Too often we're hoping for this, and I hope that. This is a guarantee from God. It's a guarantee. It's written in the very heart of God forever. Do you see that? Jesus says, ain't nobody going to pluck you out of my hand. Nobody. And we have to see that this understanding, this doctrine, if you would, this truth of glorification is ours when? Right now. It is ours when? Now. Today. At this moment. It is ours even in the midst of when we're sinning. It's still ours. It's still ours if Trump wins. It's still ours if Trump loses. It's still ours if the economy booms or it crashes. We are still God's glorified people to be revealed in us at the return of the Son of God. Do we see that? Why? Because the God who started it is the God who will finish it. I just quoted Philippians 1, 6 in a different way. <laughs> That's just my free quotation of what Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, if you know what that says, you know what I've just said. We will be given all things. Listen to what Jesus said in John 16, 15. This man is not hallucinating. He's telling you the truth from God. Think about it. Think Let's just not go through this as quick theology and words and we're getting along and I'm learning a few things. Let it soak into our souls and permeate us and let us marinate in, is that how you say it, marinate? Marinate in the truth of this, in the truth of it. Jesus said this in John 16, 15, what? All things, how much? All things, how much? 
all things that what? The Father has are mine. <clears throat> now, he's speaking as to his humanity. We don't become divine beings, as the Mormons tell you. We're talking about as God the Father has given me as the divine human, as to my humanity. He has given me all things as to my humanity. Remember, all authority, etc. He is also, all these things are mine. Right? Do we see that? They're all mine. All things that are the Father's are mine. Fine. Then John 17, 10. All things that are mine are yours. Now, what's left out of that? Will God withhold one thing from us that he has given his son? Will he? Will God withhold one thing from us that he has given his son as to his glorified humanity? This is, this is big. It's the kind of thing like, this is, Nick, this is what whispers in my mind. It really does. It can't be so. How many of you feel that? It can't be this way. Let me tell you why. Because I, at least I, am too connected to myself. I am too connected to Peter Davidson. I see me, Paul, too much. And slowly and by the Spirit, he is revealing more and more of Jesus in me so that my constant preoccupation with me and my and I and the what I'm doing, the way I feel and how I am and all of that about me is changing to be viewing him, him, him glorified, him raised, him in the bosom of the father, him experiencing forever the glory of the personal, intimate fellowship of God the Father as God shares himself fully with a human being. So that human being is filled with the glory of this fellowship of the Trinity. And my prayer is, Father, more and more and more, disconnect my preoccupation. Don't disconnect me from me. I hear people say that. <laughs> disconnect me more and more from my preoccupation, Billy, with me and how I am and what I am and who I am and whatever I am and make it more and more about this risen, ruling, reigning, returning, glorified man. Everything the Father has given to Jesus as to his humanity is ours, and we will experience it a little bit now, but when we will, when he returns, we will experience it what? Fully, without anything held back. We are going to experience the same fellowship with God the Father as the Son of God as to his humanity experiences forever. Now, you can't get any better than that. Secondly, because this man is glorified, and we are going to be glorified in him. We are now, pos positionally, we will be then, actually. Because of that, we will experience the same love that the Father has for the Son. John 17, 6 is one of the most astounding and unbelievable and audacious and amazing statements in the entire Bible. Right, Frank? That the love... The love that you have for me. He didn't say some of it. He didn't say most of it. He didn't say 99% of it. You see, River, if he leaves out one aspect, what Jesus said is a lie. The same love that the Father has for his Son. is given to us, and this same love, this same affection, this same fellowship, 
the same communion, the same. Malachi 3, 6, I am the same, I change not. The word same is important in biblical understanding. The same. I am going to experience it. And what? So will every one of us. We're experiencing a little bit of it right now. The down payment. The Arabon is the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1, 14. He's the Arabon. He's the down payment. We're experiencing some of this now. Are some of you experiencing the love of God in your lives? But then there will be an unfettered experience. I mean, this is, this in the natural, let's face it, this is crazy. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, doesn't your natural mind say, you, this is nuts. Do, are you with me on this? Anybody ever think that? Kit, do you think that way? Yeah, I knew you did. I can see you're a coach. Now, look, it's crazy, Anthony. Dwayne, it's crazy. You're right, it is crazy. But it's God's craziness. It's true. And the proof of it is the resurrection. The proof of it is where? Not in how I feel, not in what's happening. The proof of it is where? He's alive. And he lives up there and he lives in here. We sang a song last night for the old people. What is it, D? How does it, what's it, how does it go? Help me. Say it aloud. I can't hear you. You're pretty loud uh, about Jesus alive. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is risen. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just, I need him. He's always near. What? He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives in me today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. <clears throat> he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. He lives and we live in him. This is what our glorification is all about. We're just getting a thimbleful. The thimbleful. And then we will be swimming. Swimming. The same love. The same love. When you are bombarded by life, remember these things. All things the Father has a mind. All things that are mine are yours. The, the same love that the Father has for me is in you. Number three, <clears throat> we will experience the Father's same pleasure over us that he has for Jesus. Listen to this scripture from Zephaniah 317. This is talking about Yahweh and his pleasure over his people, his son. And he will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. It's the picture of a dervish. You know what that is? Of that dance of love. You know, that, you've seen those? Just, it's a picture of God the Father, if you would, as a man, just dancing around and twirling around and is so excited and is filled with great joy and pleasure and affection for the object of his love. Now we may say, I love God. But how many of us would say, God is satisfied and pleased with me as his child? Don't we have trouble with that? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's be real. This is, this is God's house. We have struggled with that. You mean, I want to be with God. But God wants to be with me. God wants to be with you, with you. God wants to be God's great zeal, his great zeal. For this reason, zeal for thy house hath consumed me in John 2, 17. He wants to be with you, with all the stuff that's been going on in your heart. He wants to be with you the way you have been acting this week. 
He wants to be with you? Yes. And he wants to be with us is so demonstrated absolutely at the cross. At the cross. Consummated in the resurrection on to the glorification. And he guarantees that he, what he wants will be happening. He wants to be with you. I have to move along. We will be brought into the very bosom of the Father. Remember John 1.18? where we will experience with the humanity of the Son of God the Father's same full acceptance and affection that he has for the Lord Jesus. Just unbelievable. This to me is mind-boggling. Is there anything in this life that can overcome this? Suppose they call you one of those names that better never be uttered verbally in the world. You know those names, those words. You know the words I'm talking about? What does someone calling me have to do with me? Are you hear me? Let's get out from underneath the bondage of other people and walk in the freedom and the glory of the children of God. What if they lie about you? It's only God's truth that it matters, James. What if they slur your name, Joyce? You have a new name written down in glory. What do you care? What do you care? And when they slur you, you say, you just don't know half of it. When they call you that filthy name, you just don't know half of it. But there is one in heaven who calls me by a different name. The full affection of a father. What can disturb us in this world today? I have to fight, fight, fight against being disturbed from this truth. How and when will we experience our glorification? Titus 2.13 the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, he who has glorified humanity in his own humanity. He has glorified humanity in his own humanity. Do we get it? He has brought humanity to the absolute utter highest greatest place that it can possibly be brought to in his own humanity glorified before the throne of God forever do we get that and when he returns the glory of his humanity of his humanity will be returning do we see that we're going to see the humanity of this risen ruling son of God glorified before the father and by the father forever we're going to see him in the clouds of glory if we're still living or we're going to return with him the glory of God in the humanity of the son of God you notice I don't say of the son himself because the son has always been glorified in the father it's the humanity of the Son of God <clears throat> that must be glorified, which has been glorified. Because the Son of God eternally has had the same glory with the Father as the Father has. We see that in the beginning of John 17. 1 John 3, 2. For we know that when he, Jesus, appears, what? We will be like him, what? Because we will see him just as he is. We will be what? We miss these words. We don't believe them. We think they mean something else. We're going to be what? Like him. Like him. When you look in the mirror in the morning and you're scared to death. Ah! We are going to be like him. It don't matter nothing at all. Don't matter nothing at all what we look like now. I know we have to fight these issues, but essentially it doesn't matter. 
You don't have to prop it up and move it around and paint it and do all that kind of stuff. It's dying. Because one day you're going to have the most beautiful cosmetic, whatever it is that we want to call it, appearance of all time because we are going to be clothed with the very glory of the Son of God as to his humanity. Let's not be overcome with all this stupidity in the world. I need to have this. I want to put this on. But I make myself, Are you kidding? You can't make yourself look better. You just make yourself look more artificial. Come on. No, no, no. It's true. It's true. We're making ourselves look more artificial. It's true. It's true. Oh, Peter, don't say that. You offend people. It's true. It's true. It's true. They went out from among us. They weren't ever part of us. You see, look, then we'll experience, then, then we will experience. We read these words, but we don't take them in. Let these words by the Spirit soak, soak, soak into our beings. Let it soak into us. Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You feel alone? Oh, I may have to go over time today. You feel alone? Soak in the fellowship that you have with Christ and the Father. You feel neglected? How can it be that you have fellowship with the Father and feel neglected? You feel abandoned? How can it be that you feel abandoned and you have fellowship with God the Father? How can these things be? They are because we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to permeate us with the truth. Come on. Come on. This is what's happening. Our eyes and our preoccupation and our senses are too pre set on us as to our present fallen condition and not set upon us as to our glorified coming uh, 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 reality. We need to change our minds about a lot of stuff. Where am I in my notes? This is what the Apostle Paul was talking about, Romans 8, 17. If, the ch if children, if we are children of God, then we're heirs. What is an heir? One who inherits the estate. Heirs also, we are heirs of God. Heirs of God, come on. We inherit from God. And fellow heirs with Christ. In other words, what God the Father has given to the Son of God as to his humanity now also belongs to us in him. The same. If indeed we suffer with him in order that we may be what? Glorified. What do you mean by suffer? Suffer. We must go through this world with all that it has for us and be glorified in the coming of Jesus. The actual glorification. We are glorified now positionally, but not practically. Then we're going to experience it. Please take all the, and I'm going to say it this way. I, 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 I say this about me first. Let's take all the idiotic, foolish, stupid thoughts and attitudes and feelings and whatever that we have about ourselves in this world and about all the situations. They're foolish. And let us set them within the context. We have inherited all things with the Son of God. And we will with him be in the bosom of the Father forever, fellowshipping. What? can stand against that. Philippians 3.21. Look at this one. Philippians 3.21. Do you have it in your notes? At our glorification, our lowly bodies, these bodies of sin, will be like Christ's glorious body. You remember in Revelation, John is taken into the heavens and he sees these angels. Remember? And he what? Falls down. Remember, angels appeared to the people in the Old Testament. All of a sudden, ah, what a magnificent. Oh, oh, God. Oh, and it absolutely fell people to the ground when an angel appeared to them. Do you know that the glory of the body of the Son of God, we will have the same kinds of bodies. 
and that body outshines all the angels put together. If we were to see our glorified bodies today, right now, we couldn't take it in. We could not take it in. We couldn't take it in. Remember when Jesus appeared before John? What? He fell at his feet what? like a dead man. What was he seeing? He was seeing the first glorified human. And we will all be glorified with the same kind of body, yet without scars. So when you see him falling in Revelation to the ground before the glorified Son of God, we're going to have the same body. Amen. The same body. So take, take heart when you look at the mirror. Take heart when you're worried about your, your whatever. That thing's about me physically. I don't want, I don't like, but you know, that's where it is at 76. But I say this, and I must say this, so what? I'm going to, in the physical, look like the Son of God. And so will all of you. Our old bodies will be transformed into new bodies, completely renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Unfettered fellowship and full fellowship with the Father and the Son forever. A body in which there is no sin. A body which is not subject to temptation. A body that is not subject to anything of the old creation. But a body that is forever perfect in every aspect. In every aspect. Fully able to absorb, absorb and enjoy the full face fellowship with God the Father. Because we're in the humanity of the Son. Amazing. This is mind-blowing. We don't speak about the glorification nearly enough. Our glorification, we will experience the full reality of Christ's righteousness. Remember Ephesians 5, 27, talk about the husband and wife. But that Christ might present to himself the church, what? In all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So those of you who have wrinkles, and somebody knows who I'm talking about, you ain't going to have wrinkles in that day. But that she should be holy and without blameless. Listen to these other... Listen to these other, other uh, uh, scriptures. First Thessalonians, and I, I just want to read through them. For we say to you by the word of the Lord that we will all, we who are alive and remain will until the coming of the Lord. And some of us may be alive and remain. If we're not, then we're coming back with him. Will not precede these who have fallen asleep who've died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Why? <coughs> Why a shout? I'm bringing my people back to myself in glory forever, right? This is exciting for the Lord. He is shout. Sometimes you just shout and words are necessary. With the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive will remain and be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet. And so we shall always be with the Lord. First Corinthians, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all die but we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet sound and the dead will be raised in perishing when we will be changed, Romans 8, 18 and following. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. Does this make more sense to you now? Does it make more sense why Paul could say that? This man was beaten and all that, and you just read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and you see what he's talking about when he said, all of this, there's nothing to it compared to what's going to happen to me. He said, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, what? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over to us all, how will he not also with him freely give us what? All things are mine and God has given me, Father, give me all things. And they're all yours. He's saying the same thing that Jesus said. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, the angels, the principalities, the things present, the things to come, the powers, the height, no depth, nor any other created in all created will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's guaranteed. It's not based at all in any wit at all. Nothing absolutely at all. It is not having anything to do with us personally. It has everything to do with God himself. Finally, 
John 13, I mean, not John 19, 30. What does that say? It is finished. <clears throat> Finally, let me connect John 19, 30 to Revelation 21, 6. Then he said to me, remember, this is the glorified Lord talking to John. It is done. It's finished. It's finished. You see, the earthly work is finished, and now the glorification is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation 21, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, being made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. Remember John 1, 14, it was among men and one man, and now it's among men and all his people. The same tabernacle. And he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. Finally, what started in Genesis 1-1 is being brought to full fruition forever. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer any death, no longer any mourning, no longer crying. First things have passed away. And by the way, 22-4, and they shall see his face. 21-10. And he carried me away in the spirit in a great and high mountain and showed me the city, holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. That's going to happen. We're going to be there. The same. That word same is very critical. The same, Malachi 3, 6, I am Yahweh. I do not change. There's no aspect of any change in God whatsoever and forever. He is the forever constant I am. And we are brought into that fellowship. And in the humanity of the risen Son of God, who is glorified forever, we will share the same glory as the Son of God. And why? And here's the bottom line of all of it. I didn't put it in your notes. I forgot it. I'll just quote from Ephesians chapter 1, verse, the Father's work in our salvation is verses 3 to 6, and it ends the glory of God the Father. Then 7 to 12 is the Son's work to the praise of His God's glory. And then the Holy Spirit's work in verses 13 and 14 to the praise of his, God's glory. All of this, all of this is for the glory of God the Father. Life is about one thing. The glory of God the Father as manifested in the glory of his risen Son in whom we are also glorified in and with him with the same glory. Amen? Amen. Next week, we'll just have a time of prayer during this particular hour for the next two weeks at least. I do need your prayers. I don't have any idea where we're going after this. It's the first time I've ever been in this situation, but we know that God will be leading. So for the next two weeks at least, I don't know if it extends longer than that, but be faithful to be here and pray. Be faithful because someone's not teaching. Let's be faithful to what God is doing in this group. Thank you so much.